Good evening. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first ever virtual presentation of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. This is one of my favorite annual events in which we honor outstanding women from around the world who are forging new paths in biomedical research. While we miss being able to see you all in person, we are so glad you have joined us online for the 17th annual presentation of this prize. For those of you who might be new to Rockefeller, please allow me to share a little bit of background about the university. We are the world's premier biomedical research institution with a singular focus, science for the benefit of humanity. We were founded in 1901 by John D. Rockefeller, who recognized that the major limit to preventing or treating disease was a lack of understanding of their primary causes. Many of the most powerful discoveries in the last century of biomedicine have occurred here at Rockefeller, including the discovery that DNA is the chemical of heredity. This breakthrough has been the cornerstone of the biomedical revolution taking place today, and Rockefeller remains at the heart of this revolution. This was underscored yet again on October 5th, when we awoke to the incredible news that our colleague, Rockefeller scientist Charlie Rice, has been named a recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Charlie's breakthrough research has led to a cure for hepatitis C, a virus that causes chronic progressive liver disease and affects more than 70 million people worldwide, causing 400,000 deaths annually. Charlie is Rockefeller's 26th Nobel laureate, including six in just the last 21 years, a remarkable string of achievements. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Charlie and 24 other Rockefeller heads of lab pivoted to direct their research to efforts to understand how this new virus causes disease, with a goal of improving the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19. Their accomplishments to date have been stunning, identifying new therapeutic targets, developing antibodies that can prevent or effectively treat infections, and discovering why some people upon infection will develop life-threatening disease while most will recover uneventfully. Returning to today's celebration, since 2004, Rockefeller has been celebrating extraordinary women who are leading the biomedical revolution by awarding them the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. To date, there have been 21 recipients of the Green Guard Prize, all spectacular scientists who have helped to shape biomedical research over the past half century. Their achievements span a broad array, array of fields, among them molecular biology, cancer research, immunology, biochemistry, genetics, biophysics, and neuroscience. Notably, three past winners of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize have gone on to receive Nobel Prizes for their research. Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider shared the 2009 Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering how the ends of chromosomes are replicated, a process that's critical to cell survival. And earlier this month, on October 6th, Jennifer Doudna was named a recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her role in developing the CRISPR gene editing technology. Tonight, we recognize another groundbreaking scientist, Joanne Corey, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the Salk Institute. A pioneer in plant biology, Dr. Corey is renowned for his, her innovative use of genetics and biochemistry to uncover fundamental principles that are critical to plant life and therefore all life on the planet. She has recently dis suggested novel approaches to alter plant metabolism that could address the catastrophic threats posed by climate change. I'm very pleased that my colleagues on the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee are joining us virtually this evening to celebrate Dr. Corey. We're fortunate to have such a distinguished group of scientific leaders taking part in the selection process, including four Nobel laureates. The complete committee list can be found on our prize website. The Perlmeister Green Guard Prize was co-founded by the late Rockefeller professor Paul Greengard and his wife, the sculptor Ursula von Reidingsvard. Paul Greengard was, and remains, a giant in the field of neuroscience. His research shed light on fundamental neuroscience with implications for causes of neurologic and psychiatric illnesses such as Parkinson's disease, depression, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's disease. 
When Paul received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in the year 2000 for his crucial discoveries about the mechanisms of signal transduction in the brain, he and Ursula chose to donate his monetary share of the Nobel Award to establish tonight's prize. Their decision was driven by Paul and Ursula's passionate belief that women scientists were not being recognized for their contributions to science at the same levels as their male peers. Paul was determined to use his new prominence as a Nobel laureate to address this issue. He decided to name this prize in memory of his mother, Perlmeister Greengard, who died giving birth to him. Paul and Ursula's vision and generosity inspired friends of the university to add their own support to the prize, which now includes a $100,000 honorarium for the recipients. The establishment of the Perlmeister Greengard Prize was the act of these two extraordinary and forward-thinking people. Let's learn more about the prize as we watch a video produced by Paul and Ursula's daughter, Ursula von Reidingsvard Grieve. The Perlmeister Greengard Prize is a real gem uh, here at Rockefeller, and I think it's a consequence of a visionary idea and the very high standards uh, with which uh, the recipients have been uh, selected. And now Professor Paul Greenberg. The genesis of this prize goes back to uh, the year 2000 when I won the uh, Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine. The prize is called the Pro Meister Green Guard Prize uh, because it was named in honor of my mother who died giving birth to me and it seemed that it would be a nice thing since I wanted to do something about discrimination against women to name it in her memory. One hope from this prize is that women who are fascinated by science, who are thinking about careers in science, will see these incredible incredible women who have been leaders in science, have been successful in science, and are recognized in science, and see these women and say, I want to be like her and I bet I can. I think people would call me the plant lady, you know. <laughs> I think they call me that because I'm one of the few plant people who really broke away from the plant community and got better known in biomedical circles, right? Whenever I gave a talk to them, people always say, hey, this is a plant lady, you know, tell us something new. We don't ever think about plants. And so I think that was kind of interesting. So I think that's my claim to fame in some ways. We all forget about them because they're doing a good job. I mean, they make oxygen that we breathe, and they're beautiful, and we all enjoy their beauty. And the role that they're playing, all of us who are here who work on plants, realize, you know, if you have all this excess CO2 up in the atmosphere, what better than plants to pull it out? We did some back of the envelope calculations that said we could have a global impact on the amount of CO2 that's up in the atmosphere already, right? You know, we can draw it down enough that it would be a global impact. And once we saw those numbers, we couldn't not do it, you know what I mean? We said we have to try to do this because the climate situation is really in a crisis, man. We're going to use crop plants, you know, the major crops that we use for food because we can't take away land from food because we have to also make more food than we're making right now. So so the idea was let's just take corn and rice and, and uh, wheat. And those three crops alone count, count for like 30% of all the arable land on Earth. I was kind of late coming to science, actually. But, you know, my background is I grew up in a very sort of large Lebanese American family. And so all my cousins were around and all my uncles and everything. So I had like five fathers the whole time I was growing up. I knew they loved me and all that. So they gave me the courage to go out there and do something, you know, that was a little risky. And so I think that helped me a lot going out there. When I look at the list of people who have won it before me, you know, a lot of them are my sort of heroes and or heroines and signs. It's really kind of funny to be part of that group. Having a woman's prize, I think is really special too. I met the first woman who got a PhD in Saudi Arabia. You know, and when she did that, her family like disowned her. It's a testament to Paul and Ursula. They did it so early. I want to thank Paul and Ursula for thinking ahead about a prize like this thing, getting such a great jury to pick the winner, you know, 
And so it gives the prize a lot of respect from other scientists. And when you get recognition from your peers, it's really the best recognition. Because the peers know what you've done. You know? And so I think that's special. And I, and I really appre appreciate having this prize. It is now my pleasure to introduce Francis Beinecke, our special guest presenter this evening. It is the tradition of this ceremony to invite a woman of distinction to present the prize. This year, we are pleased to welcome a presenter who, like our award recipient, is an environmental champion. Frances Beinecke dedicated more than 40 years of her life to advancing the mission of the Natural Resources Defense Council. When she retired as president of the NRDC in 2015, she left behind an organization that was stronger, more influential, and vitally necessary. As many of you know, the NRDC is a nonprofit environmental group that tackles many of the big challenges that face humankind, ensuring that people have access to clean air and water, preserving undeveloped land, and protecting people and animals from the myriad threats caused by climate change. Using a network of legal, financial, and scientific advocates, the NRDC operates around the globe to create and support initiatives that build healthy and sustainable communities. Frances started her career as an intern at the NRDC in 1973, when the organization and the environmental movement was in its infancy. As Frances rose through the ranks, the NRDC grew to become a leader in the fight against unregulated use of our natural resources. Francis became one of the country's most prominent voices in this movement. The victories that occurred during Francis's tenure were many and profound. The NRDC strengthened the Clean Air Act that limits sources of pollution. It helped to protect more than 100 million acres of land from oil and gas drilling. And it made significant progress in protecting waterways and their inhabitants from the effects of contamination and overfishing while also promoting preservation of clean drinking water. Notably, Francis served on President Obama's National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling. She also served on the U.S. Secretary of Energy's advisory board from 2012 to 2016. Francis holds a bachelor's degree from Yale College and a master's degree from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She received the prestigious Yale Medal and honorary degrees from Lehman College and the Vermont Law School. In 2007, she received the Rachel Carson Award from the National Audubon Society, a premier award for American women environmentalists. We're honored to have Frances Beinecke here with us today. Let's hear from her now. Thank you, Dr. Lifton, for that very kind introduction and for your gracious invitation to come here to Rockefeller University. I'm so honored to join you today, and I want to thank the members of the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee for inviting me to participate in this very special presentation. I'd like to commend Ursula von Reidensgard and Paul Greengard for establishing this important prize recognizing leading women scientists who are doing cutting edge research. Most importantly, my deepest congratulations go to Dr. Joanne Corey on the recognition of her path-breaking work in the important field of carbon sequestration and plant genetics. Dr. Corey, your work is an inspiration, demonstrating that scientific and technological solutions are emerging that will make a real contribu contribution to tackling the ever more urgent problem of our changing climate. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with this audience at this university, which has been a beacon of biomedical research for over 100 years. I was recently reading John Barry's The Great Influenza about the 19 pandem 1918 pandemic, which I'm sure many others have read recently, in which the Rockefeller Institute's early role of setting the bar of research institutions is so powerfully described. Those were the earliest days of Rockefeller, but since then it has proven again and again to be on the forefront of scientific research, developing the knowledge needed for critical advances in science and medicine. 2020 has thrown the human challenges of living on this fra fragile planet into stark relief. The pandemic has killed over 200,000 Americans, 
a million people worldwide and infected more than 35 million people so far. As the scientific and medical communities here and in other places race to develop vaccines, the role of advancing medical science for the well-being of humanity has never felt more important. I'm humbled to be speaking to you today and I applaud the amazing women and men at Rockefeller who make up this community. I've spent my career working as an environmental advocate at the Natural Resources Defense Council, working to advance solutions to the growing list of environmental challenges, and most specifically the challenge of the climate crisis. Climate change imperils human well being across the globe, especially for the most vulnerable among us. It is also the one that Dr. Corey has chosen to focus her research on at this critical moment. The scientific evidence is conclusive that the planet is warming at an unprecedented rate. The world's five warmest years have all occurred since 2015, with nine of the 10 warmest occurring since 2005. The UN IPCC reports conclude that warming is a result of our voracious appetite to burn fossil fuels. The projected human consequences of this rapid warming are devastating. From extreme heat to unprecedented weather events to sea level rise and the spread of infectious disease. And the ecological effects are equally devastating as entire ecosystems from the Arctic to the tropics are being altered. This year in the United States, the catastrophic impact of warming has never been clearer. Extreme heat has blanketed the West topping 120 degrees in Los Angeles. Unprecedented fires have ravaged and displaced communities all across the West, with fires still raging. Communities across the Gulf Coast have been inundated and battered by Hurricanes Laura and Sally, with more on the way. The ferocity of these events show what lies in store as our climate changes, as frequency and intensity of extreme events is projected to increase. How many more extreme events will be necessary before we get serious about climate policy here in the United States? We are very proficient at declaring disasters, but not at avoiding them or at minimizing their effects through adaptation and developing plans to make our communities resilient. Today, though, I don't want to talk about the bleak future if we do not act in time, but talk about what can be done and why Dr. Corey's work is so critical to our collective future. For those of us who have spent decades urging action on climate policy, our emotions fluctuate between hope and despair. I remain hopeful because there is a clear path forward to address the climate crisis both here in the United States and globally. And for the most part, we do know what it is. In 2020, the science is understood. We know the causes of climate change. We know what the rate of change is, and we do know what to do about it. We know we need to dramatically reduce emissions to net zero and move to a clean energy future. The question is, will we? Rather than despair, we all need to be motivated and like, like Dr. Corey, engage in the climate challenge and participate in our professional lives and as citizens in the steps and actions that will move us towards a more sustainable and more resilient future. We know it's imperative to keep warming below 2 degrees centigrade and hopefully within 1.5 degrees if we are to avoid the worst impacts. We know that technological and economic changes across our agricultural, energy, transportation, industrial and urban systems that are necessary for the transformational change required. We know we need an all of the above strategy of mitigation through emission reductions, supercharging our efficiency mandates, unleashing renewables electrifying the transportation sector, capturing carbon through our forests and soils and technological carbon removal. And we know we need to change our own behavior by eating less meat, flying less, using public transit, choosing renewables for our energy choices, and opting for electric vehicles. We will not avoid the worst impacts without a doubling down of ambition in accelerating investment in solutions and national policies across the world to drive this transition forward. We know these actions will head us towards the 2050 net zero goal, but we also know we need to invest more in science and technology to identify new solutions, such as Dr. Corey is doing right now. 
Most of my career has focused on the policy elements needed for this transition, and we have not yet succeeded, far from it. And we won't succeed without broader public support and political muscle. That voice of concerned citizens is beginning to be raised. Young people across the globe are joining with the young activist Greta Thunberg, striking every Friday for their future. Others are marching in our communities, demanding justice, racial justice, economic justice, climate justice. Many are joining virtual communities to demand climate action. These young people are demanding of us, imploring that we act on climate because their future depends on it. In 2018, the UN's IPCC report on climate and assessing what it would take to achieve the 1.5 degree centigrade goal showed that a major acceleration of actions would be necessary and a significant piece of that would be through sequestration of carbon through our natural systems, our soils and forests. Dr. Corey's work is specifically designed to address that goal, ramping up carbon sequestration in our plants and soils. Her work on plant genetics and carbon sequestration is straightforward in theory. We know plants suck carbon out of the atmosphere. How do we supercharge them to do more? The ideal plant project is designed to do just that, to modify plants to establish deeper waxy roots that sequester more carbon and replenish our depleted soils. Then to transfer those properties to our food crops so that we can feed the world the project is nothing short of audacious, addressing two global crises, our climate crises and food crises, which of course is why she did win the Ted Audacious Prize in 2019. And you will see just how audacious she is in her TED Talk that follows. She will do the science, but she will need help from a broader community of policymakers, agribusiness, farmers, and philanthropists to take it to scale. Dr. Corey is a brilliant scientist, a humanitarian, and a woman. She is concerned about her children's future, our children's fu future, and she decided to do something about it. She feels the pressure of time, her own time, as she has lived with Parkinson's for 15 years, and she feels the pressure of all of our time, knowing we are running out of time to get this right. She is determined, she is inspiring, and she is tough as women scientists have to be. She attributes that toughness to growing up with four brothers. She learned early on how to compete with men. Her career advanced in a scientific era when men predominated. Her early mentors were all men. That experience has forged her, own, her approach in her own lab in which she makes mentorship primary. As she has said, for me, success is was I a good mentor to those who cho chose to train with me? The answer is a resounding yes for the 100 women and men who have trained in her lab. Tonight's Perlmeister Green Guard Award recognizes Dr. Corey as the path-breaking scientist she is in plant genetics and recognizes her for tackling with determination and optimism the greatest challenge we face as a human race our fast-changing climate. She believes her research can help save the planet, and it will. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Thank you very much, Francis, for your moving words. Before welcoming Dr. Corey, I would like to share with you her powerful TED Talk from April 2019. In this talk, titled How Supercharged Plants Could Slow Climate Change, Dr. Corey shares with us how genetically modified plants could help to limit carbon in the atmosphere. Please join me in watching Dr. Corey's compelling TED Talk. I would now like to introduce Dr. Joanne Corey, our honoree this evening. Dr. Corey is professor and director of the Plant Molecular and Cellular Biology Laboratory at the Salk Institute, where she holds the Howard H. and Miriam R. Newman Chair in Plant Biology. She's also an adjunct professor in the Biology Department at the University of California, San Diego. She's been a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator since 1997, and in fact was the first HHMI investigator uh, who focused on plants. Plants are estimated to comprise a staggering 80% of the total biomass on the planet, dwarfing the contributions of all other life forms. 
Like all life, plants require a consistent source of energy to survive. Plant life shares the distinction with some microorganisms in their ability to use light from the sun to fix atmospheric carbon dioxide as glucose, providing their source of chemical energy needed for survival in a process called photosynthesis. From the time a seed germinates, it's in a race to first find and then maintain light exposure. Joanne, Joanne has spent her career probing plants' responses to environmental cues such as finding light and optimizing the exposure to it. Joanne's work has revealed the complex molecular events by which plants adjust their growth and development, as well as the location of chloroplasts, the photosynthetic machines in cells, as conditions around them change. She has illuminated myriad processes that integrate the activity of hormones, photoreceptors, and genetic regulators, and her investigations have focused not only on communication pathways that link incoming light and gene activity, but also on communication pathways between different cellular compartments. By unveiling how chloroplasts and nuclei coordinate their behaviors, she has peered into an enterprise that ensures quality control of the photosynthetic organelles and avoids wasteful gene activity if the chloroplasts are irreparably damaged. Joanne grew up in North Andover, Massachusetts with her parents and five siblings. Teased by her four brothers, toughened her up, being teasing by her four brothers, toughened her up, preparing her for her future career in a field then dominated by men who were not always welcoming to women. As a child, Joanne enjoyed reading, especially Kurt Vonnegut because of his quirkiness, and spending time with her tight knit extended family. She fondly recalls Sundays on the beach with a horde of cousins and a sense that her uncles were extra fathers. When it came time to go to college, she yearned to get a taste of life outside such a close-knit community and went to Oberlin College, where a microbiology course introduced her to the creature's complex metabolism and their genetics, and she was hooked. After earning an undergraduate degree in biology, Joanne went on to graduate school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. There she joined Sam Kaplan's lab and studied photosynthetic bacteria. And as Joanne neared the completion of her PhD, scientists at that time were just beginning to apply the new tools of molecular biology to plants. The wide open opportunities appealed to her. She joined the lab of Fred Ausubel at Harvard University Medical School as a postdoctoral fellow and helped lead the research charge toward Arabidopsis thalania, a mustard weed whose promise as an experimental organism was just beginning to emerge. Joanne wondered how plants translate information from incoming light into changes in their growth patterns. When seeds germinate underground, they make roots and stems that emerge from the soil surface. Once they sense light, they begin making branches and leaves that produce chloroplasts that harvest light energy. She wondered how do plants make these critical developmental decisions. Joanne postulated that there would be a genetic program controlling this process and sought to find mutations that would cause the program to proceed despite the absence of light. She enacted a bold strategy. After exposing seeds to a chemical agent that mutates their DNA, she grew them in the dark and looked for plants that nonetheless progressed to make shoots and leaves in the absence of light. She discovered such plants and discovered the genes that underlie this behavior, showing that there are inhibitors of this pathway that are normally degraded when the stem of the developing plant senses light. In 1988, she joined the faculty at the Salk Institute and has been there ever since. Over her long career, she has been exceptionally productive, contributing not just to the above problem, but to two other major issues in plant development and behavior. Throughout life, plants also sense when they are in the shade of competitors by sensing a reduced ratio of red to far red light, and this induces rapid growth of stems and stalks to grow into sunlit space. Joanne defined this pathway and showed that it regulates the production of the plant hormone auxin, which is the major signal for extension of shoots and stems. She also defined a novel pathway that regulates plant growth in response to environmental cues that are independent of light. This pathway is regulated by a novel family of hormones called brassinosteroids, and again, Joanne defined this signaling pathway. 
And as if this were not enough, Joanne has also made major contributions to understand how chloroplasts instruct the genes in the nucleus of plant cells to make more proteins for construction of more photosynthetic machinery, ensuring that the logistics of assembly of chloroplasts is well coordinated. Having made these and other landmark contributions to our knowledge about how plants ensure their ability to thrive in varying environments, she is now harnessing that knowledge and applying it to one of the great challenges of the moment, climate change. As we heard in her TED Talk with colleagues at the Salk Institute, Joanne aims to breed crops that are optimized to harvest carbon dioxide from the environment and keep it in the ground as a compound called subarin, rather than returning it to the atmosphere as CO2 when plant materials decompose. Joanne's numerous distinctions include membership in the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosoph and the American Philosophical Society. She is also a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. She has received many honors, too numerous to uh, count, uh, in addition to the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize, she's received the 2012 Genetic Society of America Medal. She was a recipient of the 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the 2018 Gruber Genetics Prize, and the 2019 Princess of Asturias Award for Technical and Scientific Research. You may find her profile on our Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize website to learn more about her life in science. And now I will read the citation for the prize this evening. Dr. Jo Joanne Chory, you are being honored for cracking open our molecular understanding of how plants adapt to life, light, to changes in light and other environmental conditions, which holds enormous import for agriculture, the environment, and the future of life on Earth. By conceiving and executing creative and audacious genetic screens, you have uncovered entire pathways by which plants sense and respond to light. You exposed crucial roles for hormones, photoreceptors, and many other molecules in the processes through which plants tailor their growth and development. By exploiting this knowledge, you are attempting to combat climate change. You have set the highest standard for the community of scientists by demonstrating how boldness, fresh thinking, and focus can fuel discoveries with far-reaching impact. Today, in presenting you with the 2020 Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize, we recognize and thank you for illuminating key aspects of how plants survive and thrive under ever-changing conditions, and for having the vision to apply your insights toward an enterprise that holds great promise for addressing one of the greatest global challenges of our time. It's my honor to present to Dr. Joanne Corey the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. On behalf of the Distinguished Selection Committee and all of us here virtually with you today, we congratulate you on this award. Thank you, Francis, for that lovely citation, and you, Rick, for telling my whole history of how I studied these little seedlings for years, you know. And so I also want to thank Paul Greengard and his wife Ursula von Reidensgard for creating a prize to celebrate women's contributions to science. I also want to thank the jury for considering, for selecting me. It's an honor to join the list of previous prize winners, many of whom are role models to me. I am accepting this prize on behalf of the greater than 120 grad students and postdocs who did most of the work that my lab has published with the help of more than 250 undergraduate students. I am so proud to have contributed to your scientific training. We performed our studies in the context of the fabulous science that goes on in the labs of our Salk and UCSD colleagues. We were motivated by the fast pace by which the Arabidopsis community grew, as well as by our competitors. I want to personally thank my research mentors, in particular Sam Kaplan, my PhD advisor. You tolerated my slow start in graduate school, taught me how to do biochemistry, and left me on my own to interpret data and write papers. Fred Osabel, my postdoc advisor, from you I learned genetics and the value of a good model, including finding ways to break that model. Very important for geneticists. Jack Dixon and Tom Check. Through your leadership roles at HHMI, 
you promoted and advocated for HHMI support of plant biology. And Detlef, Michael, and Steve K, you guys are the best long-term collaborators anyone could ask for. Our science was better because of you. I want to thank my posse, Lynn Artelli and Kelly Defner, who have been my right hands through some challenging times physically for me, especially over the last few years. Jack Bellotto and Sege Dabi, with, who keep my lab running. And finally, my family. Though not themselves scientists, our parents understood the value of a good education. They would be so proud to see me here today. My sister Marianne, as the eldest of six children, you set the standard for academic performance. And my brothers George, Michael, Billy, and Paul, you taught me how to wrestle. <laughs> anyway, is there a better way to prepare for an academic position? And my husband, Stephen, for the last 36 years, we've shared the joys of scientific success and of raising two children. Thank you for your patience. And Katie and Joe, thank you for giving me the privilege of loving you. From the early days I, when I could talk you into going to preschool, even when you had a slight fever, by convincing you that our family doesn't get sick, to letting me ruin your summers when you wanted to stay home and be with your friends, and um, into now when you humor me by laughing at my bad jokes, you have provided my life a balance and made me a better person. And, and now the world we know may be going away. And so our action or inaction over the next few decades will determine our fate on this planet. So I want to appeal to you, you know, as advocates for, for science, that we have to do something to intervene with what's happening with climate change. And so with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. That was a terrific uh, statement. And uh, I'm delighted to now turn to uh, have the opportunity to ask uh, you a few questions about your fascinating uh, research, albeit uh, not in person, which I regret. So first is your career has been characterized uh, by conducting incredibly clever genetic screens for plants that have mutations that cause traits that uh, the solution to which provide new insight into uh, underlying biology. Your first one looked for mutations that cause plants to go through a light-induced program of branching production of leaves and making chloroplasts despite the absence of the usual cue, light. This was a big undertaking and at the outset uh, it wasn't obvious that it would work at all. Uh, these kinds of efforts are a bit like jumping off a cliff in the dark and hoping that there's a deep lake down below. What was your thinking at that time, and was there skepticism about the effort that you were undertaking and its results? Okay. I was desperate, I think. You know, the answer is, of course, and simply. I mean, I wanted to work on this whole idea of signals get transduced and have a developmental response in, in an organism, right? So in plants, at that time, in 1984, I think, um, there was only one receptor known, and it was this receptor called phytochrome. So I started to work on that, you know, and I was going to take this kind of bacterial genetics approach to it, where I was going to get a light-regulated promoter, like what had been identified at the Rockefeller, actually, in Namhai Chua's lab and Tony Cashmore's labs. And so, and I was going to use that as a readout, you know, from this pathway. So I was going to have this photoreceptor excite this gene and it's going to turn on or whatever. Like, and it was involved in photosynthesis. But so I couldn't transform a Arabidopsis. No one had ever done that. So I couldn't get the transgenic plants I needed. So then I got desperate. I said, okay, what else can I do, you know? I better do a genetic screen that doesn't involve making a transgenic plant. So I spent half the day in the tissue culture hood and I spent the other half you know, doing these screens. And so the, the screens worked out faster than the transformation, but I did eventually get those transgenics, and that's how we did the work that's associated with chloroplast development. And so anyways, yeah. So there was some skepticism from all my colleagues in Fred's lab, but more skepticism actually came from my colleagues in the field of how light regulates plant development. So, so that's interesting. So, uh, when, 
when you first uh, did the screen, uh, how long did it take to uh, see that you had uh, interesting results and how rare were they? And what was your reaction when you saw these uh, plants uh, that were growing leaves in the dark? Well, I didn't really know what to make of them at first. You know, I said, these look pretty cool. I'm going to take these. I thought they were going to be somehow an activated photoreceptor that somehow got stuck in the on mode, you know. But they weren't that at all because they were recessive mutations. So they, they had to be some loss of function of some inhibitor. And so anyway, it took us, you know, at that time, no one had cloned a gene by walking in plants, right? So we had to get involved in making those yak libraries, you know, we were involved in everything at ground zero. And so I had a headache the first six years I had my lab, you know, because we tried to clone the first two genes that came out of that screen. And so it was just, we have to like con take 5% of the genome. And you know what that means, it's a lot of things. You have to transform in and see which ones rescue the mutant. So anyways, <laughs> I don't know. I, um, I think the mutations showed up at a normal frequency, you know, for a small gene family or whatever, yeah. So that wasn't a killer. But you know, to put out 100,000 plants is a lot of plates. And so I, mean, I was looking at little seedlings, but we had a really good screen because we could do it all in, by day five. You know, so we germinate the seeds and then they either grow tall if they were in the dark, like a wild type would grow tall, or they'd be these short little guys, and then the leaves came out later, right? But we could see they were going to make leaves even then. And so it was a pretty easy screen overall. Well, it's, it, it was an amazing result. I, I remember uh, people being very skeptical at the time that uh, there would be inhibitors of a developmental pathway so that uh, knocking out a gene and having it give this uh, what would look like a gain of function uh, response uh, was uh, uh, quite striking. I, I, I've heard that uh, during your job interview, you had staked out your goal of uh, defining this in complete signal transduction pathway from phytochrome to the control of light regulated genes uh, using this uh, primary genetic uh, approach followed up by uh, positional cloning and biochemistry and that an icon in the phytochrome field uh, said that you were brave and naive because everyone had failed in producing in pursuing phytochrome uh, research. Uh, did that uh, comment give you any pause at that point? <laughs> it scared the hell out of me. Right? <laughs> because, I mean, he was this guy. He purified phytochrome. He knew everything about it. I was interviewing there. And, um, and you have to remember, it's 1987 or something, right? So everyone has a projector with slides in there. It's pretty, the rooms are always really dark. So that voice came out at the end of my talk, out of the back. You know, I couldn't see the person or anything. It was like, well, you're a brave girl, like something like that, right? You know, he showed me all his notebooks. But what they didn't know is that plants actually have multiple phytochromes. And so they had all this data. He showed me a lot of data that I could make sense of in the context of multiple phytochromes, right? Because they weren't all doing the exact same thing. And they didn't even do it by the exact same photochemistry. And so even though they, they were in the family, you could see all the homologies between the proteins. And so anyway, so I, once I told him that, then he goes, well, maybe that would be true. You know, he was kind of retired by then. But you know, I, I can tell you, later I gave a talk about all these multiple photoreceptors involved in these early responses of plants to the seedlings of marriage. And, and it was one of those people from that era. He was sitting in my talk and he started to cry. You know? He's like, if everybody else was alive, they would have loved this talk. You know, they had all passed away by then. And so it was kind of, that was a very you know, nice, warm feeling he passed on to me at that point. Great. So it, it is striking how uh, drastically science has changed in so many dimensions uh, since uh, that time. Uh, I, I don't think many of us imagined uh, back in the 19, uh, even in the 1980s, that we would have complete genome sequences uh, for all of these major models uh, of uh, species that are used uh, uh, in exploratory and experimental biology. Uh, but uh, as, as you indicated, positional cloning at that time was incredibly 
challenging and to pull off as many uh, projects as you have uh, during that period uh, is nothing short of mind blowing. The other part that uh, strikes me is uh, you had the ability to do biochemistry at a level that most people doing genetics uh, never really dreamt of that I think really separated uh, your work from uh, everybody else's. So I, I want to turn for a moment to uh, some of the future work that uh, you've been engaged in over the last several years. Uh, as we heard in the TED Talk, uh, uh, this idea of uh, using plants to combat uh, ch climate change. Where did this idea come from in your mind? Well, I can tell you where. I think it all sprang, uh, sprung out of a conversation we had with Elizabeth Blackman, who was our president at SOC. At the time, she arrived at Salk and she told us all, seriously, she told us all, you know, it's time to go beyond your projects. All right, so enough has happened in your field, so think about bigger things. So we have five faculty who work on plants, and we, we ran a lot of ideas by each other, and in the end, you know, we had a, another colleague who's on our board of trustees, Howard Newman, who funds my chair, actually. He told us, you should work on carbon sequestration. <laughs> and so we go, okay, we'll think about that. And so we thought about it, you know, and then we realized, you know, that plants have the seasonal input into the, 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 the what's called the keeling graphs, right? I mean, the, these graphs, they show exactly what the CO2 levels are in the atmosphere. So when, uh, when the plants die at the end of the winter, that's when the CO2 levels are highest. And every year, you know, they, they go down low after and during the growing season. So you see a high and low every year. So we knew that plants have the capacity to take out the amount of CO2 that, you know, the IPCC and other organizations were saying needed to be taken out in order to get to net zero emissions, right? And so, because you can't really get people to, get, to go down to zero. You have to have other inputs. So, so we said, well, how are we going to do this? Well, plant, that's what plants evolved to do, you know. Photosynthesis has been around for four million, billion years. And so, and then plant, land plants have been around for about 600 million years, and they, way longer than humans, right? So they've had a long time to really get this thing down. So they're really good, they're really good at sucking CO2 out of the air. You know, why you would ever use a machine to do it when you have a plant? You have a plants everywhere, and plus, you know, all these crop plants, they grow all over the earth because they've been selected by breeders to have, you know, circadian clock mutations. And so, so we have plants that grow all over the world, and we have, we have a mechanism to get our seeds out there if we, have, if we had the right traits, right? So we decided the traits we're going to, we don't know the answer to this yet. It was such an audacious project, and you know, we wrote it up and get a funding for it, just because we had no data at all, you know. It's just all a thought experiment. So anyway, so three traits that we thought were going to be important, and that was in my TED talk, I thought we needed more roots, we needed deeper roots, because we need to bury the carbon deep in the soil so it stays down there. And there's not many bacteria when you go deep. And so, and then we were going to store it in this carbon-rich molecule called Subarin. And super doesn't have many oxygens in it at all, so it makes it hard to decompose by, by microbes in the soil, right? And so that's what we're working on now. We're doing the science behind this idea. And the idea is to get these plants out, you know, if we, if we can combine the traits so we get plants that can sequester a lot more carbon. Because we don't think anybody's ever tried to modify roots much in terms of breeding, right? So we think there's going to be a lot of natural variation out there that will contribute to this. And so I think we can do it, but the challenge is going to be we need 500 million hectares of arable land. So we have to do it in crops that people eat, right? Because if you take the, you look at the top six crops that are grown in the world, they use more than half of all the arable land on Earth to grow corn, wheat, rice, soybean, you know, and uh, canola. <laughs> it's amazing when you think about it. So it's a huge infrastructure from agriculture, so it's not going to be very expensive if we can piggyback onto that. So that's fascinating. So in, in your estimate, uh, if you do the back of the envelope calculation, uh, what would be the impact if uh, you were able to uh, get 
well, for example, all of uh, uh, the uh, farmed uh, plant life uh, to produce, you know, X more uh, percentage of subarin rather than uh, releasing it uh, as CO2. Okay, so the calculation I think I usually do is if you take if we got 50% of all the land mass that was growing those six crops, and we had 30% 30% higher levels of stabilized carbon, that would give us about five gigatons of CO2 a year. That that's substantial. I mean, I think the IPCC is saying we need to do between two and twenty. But you know, there's a lot of other approaches that people are trying. And our approach could be combined with some of the other ones that involve nature, you know. Yeah, so I, some of the more geological ones, you know, they use rock weathering or whatever to, to keep the carbon down. And so I think it, it's going to be really interesting. The thing is, how do you fund this stuff, right? <laughs> there's no study section that says, you know, we want to see we want to see how plants are involved in climate change. You know, so I mean, it's a problem. These are grand challenges and uh, very important uh, for the future of the planet to try uh, uh, th really imaginative approaches uh, like this. And then, what what would be the ultimate fate of uh, all this uh, underground subarin uh, ultimately? Well, I think. All our soils are depleted of carbon on Earth, and it's not going to be sustainable agriculture in another 50 years, you know. And so what the super will do is lay, lay down some more soluble organic carbon. But it's recalcitrant, and it breaks down eventually. It's, it's going to be decades to centuries based on the data, a little bit of data that's available. But I think, you know, that, I think it, what it will do is rebuild the soils, because once you get carbon back in soils, then you can accumulate nitrogen, phosphorus, and all those other things that plants need to take up from the soil. That's great. T turning to uh, a last topic, uh, I want to come back to the theme of uh, the Perlmeister uh, Green Guard Prize, uh, and this is, uh, of course, women in science. Uh, uh, first, uh, congratulations again on your remarkable uh, career. Uh, I've heard you say in uh, other uh, venues that uh, research is a terrific career for mothers. Can you elaborate on that? Well, <laughs> I think it is, you know, because you really can do everything on your own time. You can travel as much as you want to or not, you know. I, and I think traveling everywhere doesn't necessarily make your lab rise up out of whatever, <laughs> you know. I mean, you have to just be kind of strategic, but I, I felt I had a victory, actually. My daughter, who's 25 years old, she came back from college a few years ago, and she lived with us for a year. She said, I don't ever remember you working this hard, right? And so I said, like, yes, you know, because I was like working where she couldn't see me, you know, whatever, you know, she would go to bed and I would stay up and work. I was working, I was working pretty hard back then, but she didn't feel it, you know. And that made me feel like I had really been there for her when she needed me. And so I, that's why I think, you know, it is a good, it's not a bad field to be in if you're a mother. Because, I mean, my husband, he, he's a scientist too, but he works at a company. He's like a slave to whoever's sending him wherever, you know. And I can just say I can't go to that meeting because my daughter has her dance recital that week or whatever. You know, and I, and I just did that. And so... That's why I think it's not a bad field for, to be a mother in. What advice uh, would you have for uh, budding uh, women scientists uh, who are uh, uh, headed, up, headed out on uh, their careers? You have to just persevere. Persevere, the, love the good times, but persevere in the bad times, right? And don't let it wear you down, make it, make it motivate you. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That's great. Well, once again, uh, all, all of us here at Rockefeller want to extend our warmest congratulation, congratulations uh, to uh, Joanne Corey on being the recipient of the 2020 Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. A special thank you as well to Francis Beinecke for being part of this celebration today. To our, all of our virtual community out there, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. We look forward to seeing you all in person at a future event. And until then, I hope you and your families stay safe and well. Have a terrific evening. Good night.